Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Abby Robinson. I'm an advisor with the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, or DCAF. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's event, Preparing for the Coming Storm, the Security Sector and the Environment. Just a couple of notes before we get started. First, today our discussion will be in English, but we do have interpretation available in French, Spanish, and Arabic. So please, if you'd like to use one of these, select the correct language and also remember to mute the original audio when you do so. We would also very much welcome everyone's active participation in today's discussion. So if you have questions or comments, please share them with us using the Q&A function in Zoom, and we will get to as many of these as possible later in the discussion. What I'd like to do to start off today is give you just a brief overview of the kind of work DCAF does for those who might be a bit less familiar with our organization. DCAF works on good security sector governance and security and justice sector reform as a cornerstone of peace and development. We work with a wide range of partners, including security providers themselves, um, both public and private, the ministries which have a role in managing some of these institutions, parliaments, independent oversight commissions or human rights commissions, missions, policy, procedures, practice, and other aspects of institutional reform to ensure that security can be provided in a framework of democratic governance, the rule of law, and respect for human rights. Ultimately, our work is about making states and people safer and more secure. And to give you an illustration of what it looks like to consider the safety of people, so human security in the context of a changing environment, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Viola. Thank you very much, Abby, and also a very warm welcome from my side. My name is Viola Jordash. I'm an SSR advisor at DCAL's International Security Sector Advisory Team, ISAT, providing support to international donors. And I'm really delighted to be moderating today's panel together with Abby. And I would like us to start with a concrete example so that we can really picture what we're talking about today when saying that the human, the national and the environmental security are so closely interconnected. So let's imagine an ocean, a river delta and a coastal area with a very crowded urban area. And let's think of a couple of these interconnected risks for the communities that are living there. The water is being increasingly polluted that means there is very little access to safe drinking water, also leading to community tensions. This pollution affects the fish stock, which many people depend on for their livelihoods. The fish are also getting depleted by illicit overfishing. Because the maritime space is very difficult to survey and control, not much has been done to stop that. And that also enables smuggling and trafficking, increasingly affecting the crime, crime rates in the city and with many former fishermen joining the criminal networks. Because of rising sea levels and changing weather patterns, there's also more and more flooding. This used to be less problematic, but now many former swamps and coastal forests have been converted into informal settlements by this influx of urban migrants. So I think we really see how here the human, the national and the environmental security are closely interconnected. We've seen the ecosystems and the ecosystem services which are being disrupted, the livelihoods, the risks to communities from natural disasters, but also from conflict and crime. And in all these different dimensions, the security sector has a protective role to play a role in building resilience and mitigating the risks and impact of these changes on communities. And with that picture in your head, I'm going to hand over back to you, Abby. So how does this fit into our evolving conceptual conversation around climate and security? Thanks, Viola. I think it's important to note before we move forward that a lot of good work is being done in this domain already. The policy debate, of course, continues to evolve around the links between climate and security. There's a growing body of research on these topics and security institutions themselves are naturally concerned with planning for a future which will be fundamentally impacted by this changing environment. Uh, so what is it that we hope to accomplish with today's conversation? By bringing together colleagues who have deep expertise in the environmental and security sectors, you know, our aim today is to have a creative conversation in which we can think together broadly about 
the risks being faced by human beings and the ecosystems on which they depend, sources of resilience within that space, uh, you know, and how these two to get together can inform security priorities and responses in the future. We're really excited about the opportunity to bring together these policy domains today. We have an excellent panel lined up. You'll hear more about them in a few minutes. And I think you'll hear as we go through the discussion today, our panelists offer different perspectives on a couple of key questions, including what will actually make us safer and more secure in an era shaped by climate change? And what contributions might the security sector be able to make at the intersection of the environment and human security? And with that, I'll hand it back to Viola to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. And to set the scene and give us a bit of a broad background, it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Marley, who is a policy analyst at the OECD, where he leads the OECD States of Fertility Series work stream. Previously, he worked as a security sector reform advisor for DECA for us, leading the project in the Gambia. And prior to that, he was an officer in the Irish Defence Forces, who's also served on operational tours with NATO, the UN and the EU. This autumn, his team at the OECD will be publishing the first of a series of papers on fragility, climate change and environmental degradation. And with that, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Viola, and to DCAF for the invitation. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I will start with maybe a couple of definitions so that you're clear on where the OECD is coming from. Uh, the first is that how we define fragility, and that is as the combination of exposure to risk and insufficient coping capacity of a state system or community to manage, absorb or mitigate those risks. The second is on environmental fragility. Entre fragilité et les risques, et tout au long de cette année, nous avons procédé à une révision de notre cadre multidimensionnel de fragilité. What does this mean for the conversation today? The first point I would want to make is that ecological fragility due to climate change and environmental degradation is increasingly shaping state and human security challenges particularly in fragile and conflict-affected contexts. Environmental fragility needs to be understood, therefore, in, as a, in, in two distinct ways vis-a-vis vis human systems. How the environment affects human systems through events such as natural disasters, and how the human systems affect the environment. Uh, the latter is by far the most significant in this context because it compromises the ability of natural systems to provide ecosystem services, which provide the underpinning uh, for all societies. Both have implications for the security sector. Risks stemming from these areas do not stay confined to the environmental domain. They cascade to, to all forms of human, human activity, depending on the context. In this sense, ecological fragility can accelerate socioeconomic, political health and security fragility, and inversely, political, social, economic fragility tend to accelerate further ecological collapse. The second point I would make is that climate change and environmental degradation act as risk multipliers, compounding upon fragilities that already exist. For example, food and water insecurity, adverse health impacts or economic loss in already disadvantaged populations. The global experience of systemic shocks, forest fires, pandemics, economic crisis, alter the terms in which the security sector respond. And the economic environmental aspect of this is no different. Our experience of the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated how risk can cascade through systems, often with unforeseen consequences, or from sectors not traditionally considered uh, for analysis by, by security actors. So in this way, we can see how issues such as soil health can closely intertwined with deforestation, agricultural intensification or mining can be relevant to security sector analysis. Similarly, marine resources, as eloquently pointed out by Viola in her introduction. Uh, while it is true that water, water scarcity, which is often most cited in security conversations, it, while it is true that it, is not necessary, it, it does not necessarily lead to conflicts, it is also true that conflicts where access to water is a contributing factor have increased dramatically from 27 in the 1980s to 466 in the 2010s and rising. Each of these um, and more can contribute to biodiversity collapse with security sector implications. To give you an example, at least 40% of the rainfall in the Ethiopian highlands feeding the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, the GERD, comes from the Congo Basin forestry systems, which are currently threatened by deforestation due to illegal activities and infrastructure construction. The consequences of this are many. A depleted Nile flowing downstream from Ethiopia could be disastrous, resulting in critical levels of food and water insecurity and engendering political and socioeconomic destabilization. This is a hard security challenge, building pressure into the security dimension. 
But at each step, as you go back through the chain, there are also human security issues. For example, the connection between livelihoods and eagle deforestation and corruption. Therefore, it's not a challenge for any one institution within the security sector, but rather a collective challenge for the security sector and with its other partners across government that must be considered. The third point I want to make is that the context most affected by climate change and environmental degradation are often those most in need of security sector reform. Of the 22 conflicts, con conflict affected contexts, 12 are among the most exposed to climate change, accounting for 700 million people. The impact of climate change will be more pronounced in fragile contexts in the short to medium term as climate conflict and fragility risks converge. So, for example, fragility and conflict affected contexts are often more dependent on nature based economies. They suffer disproportionately from climate disruptions and ecological plundering. The short term economic gains that, that tend to hold sway in these contexts often are overshadow the extensive ecological, economic, and social costs of pursuing those gains. As disasters increase globally, fragile contexts are often in the front line. And this has also unforeseen cascading effects beyond the initial requirement to deal with disasters themselves. So for example, this can happen along supply chains, trade routes and financial flows. For complex regeneration to work in fragile conflict, affected contexts, therefore, it must contend with all of these issues and others, such as weak governance, corruption, transnational crime, and the protection of human and environmental rights. So what does this mean for the security sector? Security sector institutions will need to adapt their models to identify the connections that matter for security. This is vital for preventing fragility and preventing um, conflict. Security institutions will need to respond to more disputes, violence and conflict driven by climate change and environmental de degradation. Analyzing, adapting analysis to ensure that security institutions are aware of the ecological pressures and how they connect and affect with the security sector is a logical first step for most and all security sectors to take. Building preemptive capacity for disaster management is also crucial. Institutional capacity building, early warning systems, environmentally focused resilience analysis, policy dialogues and consensus are all examples of measures that can be taken to help prepare the security sector to play its role. The security sector will also be need to be mindful of the implications of the roles that they're being asked to assume in the name of environmental protection. For example, risks associated with mineral extraction in these countries link up with governance, human rights, corruption, and, and, and equitable economic distribution. For, so, and we've already, see, we've already seen examples of excessive security measures applied to state actions in response to small-scale mining, mining in areas such as Ghana, Liberia, Burkina Faso, and Niger. The second point I would make is that this may, this may also require structural reform across the security sector, perhaps uh, with a greater emphasis on concepts such as civil defence or rethinking policing models to protect ecosystems. Security sectors have long had a role to play in addressing environmental issues, from surveys to flood reliefs, fighting forest fires and dealing with pollution at sea. These have often been seen as secondary functions, but could the evidence that's coming to, to uh, the public now suggest that these, some of these issues, may, some of these tasks may become primary functions for security sectors in some contexts? How the security sector thinks about its multi-use capabilities, particularly for DR, may also need to change as a result of this evidence. Building coping capacity to respond to and where possible, possible mitigate crisis might require new and renewed institutional capacity. For example, building civil defence capacity in support to environmental protection as a public good for responding to climate and environmental degradation can help to desecuritize responses and also to build local capacity and cohesion in response to identified issues such as floods, fires or drought relief. I will pause there. I think it's, I hope that has set the scene and looking forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and perfectly on time. I think it was a matter of a couple of seconds that you were in on the time frame. So thanks a lot for that, but also thanks a lot substantively for setting the scene with, with these interventions and pointing out so elaborately these in, interlinkages between the environmental, the human and the national security. Again, stressing that this is happening, especially in fragile contexts where SSR might be needed. You've also stressed the need for a shift for security sectors towards a stronger role in civil defense and DRR. And here we heard about the importance of oversight. And you mentioned some of the challenges that are associated with involving the security sector here, especially if that means a role in regular closer contact with populations. So 
Thanks for also stressing the importance of good governance of the security sector and oversight to mitigate these risks. This is very much corresponding also to some products that we're doing on strengthening risk management, compliance and due diligence aspects and people-centric approaches to security. And finally, you stress the need for the analytical capabilities to jointly assess the cascading and multidimensional risks. And on this, I think this is the perfect transition to our next speaker, Dr. Matthias Wackenagel, who is the person together with Bill Rees behind the footprint concept, as in carbon footprint or ecological footprint, after starting that 30 years ago, he also founded the Global Footprint Network, a sustainability think tank possibly most known for its annual Earth Overshoot Day. His honors include the 2018 World Sustainability Awards, the 2015 IAAI Global Environment Award, and the 2012 Blue Planet Prize. And I might also mention that we have the pleasure of having a paper coming out soon together with Matisse on operationalizing the overshoot concept for security. Matisse, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Viola, and thank you, Dika, for holding this great event and, and also the co-panelists and even more so probably the people who kind of are joining us on, on this event, which I think is extremely timely. We are entering a new world. And let me start a little bit explaining the context. What is this storm? I would say it's the material bottleneck for humanity is what the planet or the biosphere or nature, whatever you want to call it, is able to renew. The biomass is able to renew. So climate change is merely one of the problems, but there are many others like biodiversity, water loss, deforestation, etc. And they are all symptoms of our competition for, the, for, comp for our competing pressure on regeneration. We are competing for what nature is able to renew. When I say we, I mean humanity. And indeed, we're not only competing, but we are starting to overuse this regeneration. That's what's called ecological overshoot. So human demand is able and actually it is exceeding what earth can renew we have estimates very basic estimates just to look at what earth can renew compared to what people can what people take that show us that demand now exceeds what earth can renew 73 percent it's like using 1.7 earth at the same time while we only have one or it's 73 times faster we use the resources of the biological resources than what Earth can renew. That adds up to a debt. One debt is the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and that's already the very high level. If you include all the greenhouse gases, all the greenhouse gases, not just CO2, we're now at 502 parts per million, and the 450 ppm level allows us to stay within two degrees Celsius with a 66% chance. So we're already committed to a very high level of climate change and extreme weather, etc., as part of that overshoot debt. So what we do by looking at all the competing pressures, we're not just looking at the last straw that's breaking the camel's back. We're looking at all the straw that's leading to the demise of the camel. And we would say overshoot, ecological overshoot, is probably the second most significant risk to humanity in the 21st century. And I say second most important because the most significant risk is not looking at it, it's not dealing with it. And that's what's happening currently. So we're entering a new area, it's called the Anthropocene, uh, and, the, and the rules will shift. Uh, so we cannot really extrapolate so easily from the past into the future because what we're doing is we're running a Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme or pyramid scheme is where you use the investments, the new investments to pay for the old investors. You take from the future to pay for the present. That's what we do ecologically. We use the resources from the future to pay for the present. And Ponzi schemes don't end up well. Bernard Madoff spent 12 years in prison. Uh, they are illegal in most countries, but for some strange reasons, ecologically, uh, the ecological Ponzi scheme we seem to encourage even. In the early stage, being part of this depletion process is economically beneficial. You can increase your economic activities, but as you get more towards the end stage where it gets fragile, when you continue to depend on resources that are not available in the long run, if you continue to depend on, on resource insecurity to run your engines, makes you extremely fragile. 
So what I would like to emphasize is the big misconception really is that we that the most limiting factors are non-renewable resources like I don't know fossil fuels or or, or ores, but in reality that the renewable ones are even more fragile, and so by depending on these resources that are not available in the long run, we make ourselves fragile. So we build conflict potential into all kinds of domains. Now, what does that mean in terms of human security? And I'm not a human security expert. We are more accountants. We look at the economic implications of these trends. But essentially what we can say in any domain is that the future has never been more predictable than today. We know that people will want to eat, they will want to sleep, they will want to move around, etc. And we know that there will be more extreme weather, there will be more climate change, and there will be less ecological resources. So cities, companies, countries, regions, villages that do not prepare themselves for this future will be at a large disadvantage. And I think that's the big misconception that we think it's just kind of this global thing. But actually, this global thing, this overshoot is our increasing context. And the question is, are we reacting to this context? Let me briefly show you how the word looks from this perspective. And I'm sharing the screen here. Uh, let me see if I can do that easily here. This is, is that correct? Can you see it now? So this is a map if you go to data.footprintnetwork.org that shows every country like a farm and it shows how much do we use compared to what the farm is able to renew. It's an analogy to farm, but it's not totally an analogy. It's actually true. So if you look, for example, at Spain here, we can see you know, that how the demand is far higher than it's-, it's, it's Sorry it's really to interrupt, but I think yeah. we cannot see your screen. Okay. Sorry, I saw somebody nod. That's a, a miss, this Perfect. guy here. Can Thanks. you see? So, okay, let me close again. So here is, is, it shows the world, like like every country, as if it was a, a farm. And the deeper red, the more you use compared to what you have. Let me pr look at Spain again. You can see how the demand per person is increasing, and then the financial crisis let it down quite significantly and Spain hasn't fully recovered, but it's running a significant deficit. Now, the big point really is the following. 72% of the world population now live in countries that have both an ecological deficit and they have less than world average income. That means in the long run, we cannot run a deficit and they don't have the financial means to outcompete other countries in the global market to get the resources they need. Now the overuse is massively fueled by fossil fuels, which we want to get out of, but they allow us to get this high resource metabolism. If we don't have the fossil fuels and we can't, we, we can't deplete, then that the, the, the crush the, the, that, that, that we will experience will get significantly stronger. So what are the solutions? That's the last minute, I think, um, the last minute to uh, spend on that. It's actually quite simple. Let me see here if I can get here to the other one. <clears throat> Uh, we, have, we, we use the hand as an example of saying what are the big domains where we can intervene that are both economically beneficial as well as allow us to increase our resource security. Obviously, we can strengthen what ecosystems can renew. That's that one. And then we have the four fingers that represent demand. How do we build our cities? Because they, they basically build us into a consumption pattern. Uh, like how our houses are built, how much we have to transport, et cetera, how we live, how we power ourselves, the energy system, very significant. Is it solar or is it fossil fuel dependent? How we eat currently, food alone requires half of the earth's regeneration. And then how many we are, if you double as many people, uh, we have half as much planet available. These are very slow trends, the population trend, but quite significant. If we had reproductive rates, like in, in, in Portugal, for example, or, or Italy around the world, we would be about at 4 billion people in 2100. Current trends is more pointing towards 10 or more billion people. So there are options to act. But I think the main point is to say we are entering a new world. The, the, the competition for regeneration will become far more significant. It's a background radiation. It doesn't, it's not a kind of a sudden crisis. It's a pressure that builds and which will make resource security an ever more significant par parameter of economic success, but I think also of conflict. Thanks very much, Matisse, for introducing us to this overshoot concept, which I think in the security sector reform community might be quite new to some of us. And also the strong message that climate is but one factor here. And you said that the future is 
predictable or has never been more predictable than now. And what is interesting to me here is, can the state of nature and these pressures on it that you described tell us something about the future likelihood of conflict or crime or violence? Or how could we use these environmental metrics and data to use their predictive potential for early warning and for foresight of security and crime hotspots, for example? I think one important idea to take forward here is also looking beyond these national level indicators, which we've seen on the map and which are very which tell a very strong story, but also looking at the more local level and granular analysis. You spoke about the population growth and that overconsumption are also distributional problems, stressing, for example, the carrying capacity of one area in particular. So we're wondering how increasing services, including security and justice services outside capital areas could, for example, lessen those stresses on the carrying capacity of one area. And we've also seen that this is not only a rural problem, but it's very much or even more so in urban settings. And this probably also should be an increased focus for the SSR practitioners. Finally, the overshoot metrics could or should play maybe a bigger role in funding decisions. We've recently completed a project on right sizing and right financing of security sectors and I'm wondering how can we bring these overshoot metrics in to help allocate funding to where it really makes people most safe and most secure and on that point of making people safe and secure against risk and particular disaster risk I'm delighted to introduce the next panelist Dr. Animesh Kumar who is the head of the UNDRR office in Bonn that serves as the organization's global facility for climate action, comprehensive risk management, disaster data, and monitoring the Sendai framework and SDGs. Previously, Animesh served as the deputy head of the UNDRR regional offices for Asia Pacific and Africa, where he led regional policy and coordination on DRR. In his previous positions, Animesh worked in other UN entities in Africa and Asia, including on a UN secondment to the government of Ethiopia as their policy advisor on DRR and climate change. And with that, over to you, Animesh. Thanks, Viola, and thanks, Abby. It's a, it's a very topical webinar and comes just at the right time following the recent release of the IPCC report and in run-up to the COP26. So just the right time in terms of the discussion we are having. In my intervention today, I'll focus on the role of the security sector in managing the risk of climate change and disasters. So why security sector? While climate change is a multiplier of security risk, which we all acknowledge, it is not the sole cause and does not necessarily lead to violent conflict or other security problems, which rather are the result of clusters of factors specific to, specific to the local circumstances. In particular, the quality of governance has been found to have the greatest impact on the chances of tensions developing into security crisis. And this is, it is this aspect that I'll focus on today in terms of risk governance. So the role of disaster response and recovery, role of security sector in disaster response and recovery has been outlined earlier and has been very well established. The civil defense based organizations like the military force are already have deployed in strategic areas facilitating immediate humanitarian assistance, disaster response. Then we play a very strong role in rapid damage and need assessment in terms of immediate deployment of search, rescue, and mass evacuation. They ensure that area is safe and secured for civilian and humanitarian workers. And at least on the ex ante side of disasters, so far security sector has played a good role in developing scenarios to strengthen preparedness efforts. So let me now move from management of disasters to management of risks, especially in terms of the institutional perspectives that I would want to provide. But conventionally, the focus of disaster risk reduction has remained on the management of disasters as an event, with the efforts being to enhance our response capability, including through strengthening preparedness efforts. However, we have realized over time that management of risk and its underlying causes leading to disasters is a much more efficient approach and is much more effective in saving lives and livelihoods rather than only focusing on managing the disasters. 
And this new paradigm marked by the endorsement of the Sandai framework requires a very different approach. It does not see development and risk management as two diverse processes, but embeds one into the other, locating risk at the very DNA of sustainable development. As we say, development that does not take risk into account cannot be sustainable. So this new approach requires very different set of skills. The growing understanding of, of risk complicates this further. Risk is no more seen to be operating in isolation, but is systemic in nature, as Dr. Jonathan mentioned at the outset. It cascades across sectors and with multiple interconnected processes and nodes. Hence, management of systemic risk is often an issue of coordination, coordination across sectors, actors, and domains. The changing nature of risk and its management has inspired many governments to undertake institutional reforms, either expanding the scope of their National Disaster Management Offices, the NDMOs, or relocating disaster risk reduction portfolios to other ministries and departments. The NDMOs so far who have had a very traditional security focus in many countries now increasingly focus on risk analysis and strengthening their predictive capacities to better manage disasters and disaster risks. Several countries have shifted their DRR portfolio from a civil defense or civil protection organization to the office of the head of the state or a ministry responsible for coordination across ministries. And there's several examples across countries who have done so. The obvious question that arises is what is the role of such primarily security centric organizations in a prevention centric disaster risk reduction? And I'll offer three core examples. One is in terms of disaster risk data. The NDMOs are at the forefront of disasters and hence collect very valuable information which when compiled across events over time and space can provide very important insights for managing future disaster risks. UNDRR, for example, us, we maintain a disaster loss accounting system that is currently being used by over 100 countries. And, and needless to say that majority of the these databases come from the NDMOs and provide a very concrete evidence of the impact of climate change, um, some of the very specific examples I would want to highlight where countries where NDMOs are actually managing these databases like Mauritius or Maldives. The management of complex risk, the second one is very important because we have seen that the complexity of risk has been further heightened by new complex disasters like the COVID-19, for example, which has sensitized the world to the complexity of threats posed by non-conventional security crises. Here again, the experience of NDMOs has proven out, proven out to be very handy. Several countries have used disaster management policy and regulatory instruments to act against COVID during the initial months of COVID. It becomes even more relevant given the compounding nature of disasters, as we have seen during the case of cyclones and floods in the last two years when COVID was still at play. And finally, disaster risk governance. NDMOs sit at the core of the whole disaster risk management continuum that spans from prevention, preparedness, response to recovery. Hence, they are very well placed to ensure that they can coordinate across ministries for both prevention as well as preparedness and response efforts. Good examples of security centric NDMOs that have done well in integrating DRR and adaptation and both together into development planning include Mongolia and Philippines. And another very important contribution that the security sector is making and can make further is to ensure that the response and recovery efforts in the aftermath of a disaster do not create risks for the future. And this can range from managing post-disaster waste to managing displaced population. It's just like we talk about risk-informed development for the development sector, we should also talk about risk-informed response for the security sector. So in conclusion, as risks get complex, it will increasingly become challenging to, the, to leave it to its management to one or a single set of organization. This requires a comprehensive approach that transcends across humanitarian and development worlds and across different sectors and usage of diverse approaches, including the nature-based solution that Dr. Dr. Mathias was actually referring to. The security sector sits at a very nodal spot in this equation. However, as the recent IPCC report has pointed out, extreme events are only going to increase it's hence an imperative that the security sector invests more in risk analysis and strengthens its predictive capacity to ensure an adaptive security sector governance and be able to act ahead of such events. At the same time, it is important for the security sector to be actively engaged, to be able to adopt a whole of government approach to risk management. 
So I'll stop there. Thank you and back to Ireland. Thank you very much, Animesh. And thanks a lot for sharing these very concrete examples from the field and very encouraged to hear about the good contributions that security sectors are already making in terms of the logistical capabilities, the intelligence and scenario planning you mentioned. And you also mentioned the changing nature of these more complex and cascading risks and the new paradigm for their management under the Sendai framework and how important it is to strengthen the security sector's roles also in the ex-ante efforts to not only have their role in the relief and recovery phases. And this brings us to the obvious point on institutions and governments. You said the most important factor to manage complex risks is governance. So you spoke about the legislation and the mandates of security sector institutions, ensuring coordination and whole of government approaches as well as timely information sharing and spinning this bit further, the right capabilities to then also deliver on these mandates. You also said that the risks should be managed in a way that don't create new risk. And here may be a point also from a conflict prevention perspective. One of the risk factors we've identified in our prevention work is that discriminatory delivery of these services like DRR, et cetera, when specific population groups are excluded or discriminated against can be triggers of conflict. And here again, security sector governance really can mitigate these risks. And even more positively, if you build on this idea of the equitable and people-centric service delivery, security sectors delivering these protective services to a population can really help strengthen the social contract and strengthen the legitimacy of a government. And even contribute to sustaining peace. And on that positive note, I will hand over to my colleague, Abby, to guide you through the second part of the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Viola. And I'm very happy now to be able to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Yuha Sikamaki. Yuha is Chief Economist at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or IUCN. Throughout his career, he has specialized in the economics of nature, including natural capital valuation and accounting, and also assessment of benefits and costs of conservation investments. Prior to joining IUCN in 2017, he was Associate Research Director and Thomas J. Klutznik, Senior Fellow at Resources for the Future in Washington, DC. He's authored more than 60 publications on topics including environmental and resource economics, econometrics, and ecology. And recently he led development of the IUCN flagship report, Nature in a Globalized World, Conflict and Conservation. You have the floor is yours. Thank you, Abby. Thanks uh, so much for that introduction uh, and thanks for organizing this event and the opportunity to join my distinguished uh, colleagues uh, to discuss this uh, important topic. Um, you, you mentioned IUCN, uh, just a couple of words uh, by way of uh, introduction. IUCN uh, um, is a membership union composed of both uh, government and uh, civil society organizations with uh, more than 1400 uh, members and more than 18 uh, 18,000 experts in, in our commissions. Uh, IUCN uh, has a long uh, history in terms of uh, work uh, uh, related to conflict, especially in the context of international law and protecting and conserving nature in times of conflict and, and, and after conflict. Uh, the, the, the importance of con uh, conflict uh, uh, and security issues to conservation today are, are demonstrated by the fact that uh, the IUCN dedicated the first uh, uh, report in the in the in the IUCN flagship report series uh, uh, on issues related to conflict and conservation. The broad uh, purpose of the report series, Nature in a Globalized World, is simply to demonstrate the imperative, imperative of nature to human well-being and, in fact, all life on Earth. We do that by addressing interlinkages between key global challenges and nature. And the, the, uh, the broad objective here is to help uh, in, 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 uh, in, in ways we can to bring nature conservation into mainstream political and economic decision making. Climate issues have uh, already entered the uh, mainstream where we're, we're working uh, towards uh, uh, having uh, conservation and nature issues entering mainstream too. Uh, 
So the first report, as I noted, addresses conflict and conservation. This was launched in, um, in April and it's available in this, uh, in this link. Uh, in the rest of my, my uh, intervention, I'll give you a flavor of the, of the report and uh, how it was done and what we, what we found out. The report uh, uh, focuses, focuses on armed conflict very specifically and the role of living nature and renewable natural resources in this context. One of the key questions we address, is there a, a way, is there a way to conserve and better manage nature in order to prevent uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, or mitigate the pressures that, that drive, uh, drive conflict? Uh, the report does this by examining uh, multi-directional linkages between conflict and nature. Uh, there's an assessment of, uh, of effects of, of conflict on nature, uh, and there's, a, there's a, a quite extensive assessment of uh, how nature and natural resources, including their availability and condition, have uh, uh, linkages to conflict, the propensity of conflict emerging and lasting. The report uses a range of approaches. There's a, a synthesis of current literature, which is very rich in this area. Uh, there's a, a, a quite a, a significant uh, amount of uh, explanatory analysis uh, and primary analysis using data, data um, and uh, statistical econometric techniques. We also uh, feature a number of case studies from around the world. The report was uh, led by myself and Tom Brooks, IUCN chief science, scientist, uh, and we benefited from having almost 30 contributors in total from, uh, from very different backgrounds and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, by, by way of a geography and, uh, and expertise. Uh, I'll just give you a quick flavor of the key results uh, that we find. Uh, first, uh, uh, discussing how armed conflict affects nature. Uh, we find that the impacts of uh, conflict on nature are overwhelmingly negative. There is some evidence that uh, conflict can, uh, can uh, prevent uh, um, destruction of nature, but we find that that evidence is limited and typically that effect is, uh, is time-lived. Uh, when the conflict uh, um, uh, ceases or, or eases off, uh, those pressures that, that drive degradation of nature tend to pick up again. So uh, the benefits are short-lived. We do find uh, that uh, species uh, uh, especially threatened species are more likely than, uh, than one would expect uh, by kind of random chance to, to occur in areas of armed conflict. There's some evidence that protected areas, uh, uh, key biodiversity areas may contain less conflict than expected, but we, we find that this effect could be very much uh, depending on, on the scale of the analysis uh, and, and uh, deserves uh, uh, further, uh, further work. Uh, when we evaluate the effect of nature and natural resources on conflict, uh, we find uh, uh, broad evidence that degradation of nature, especially, is strongly, albeit variably, associated with increasing uh, uh, risk of conflict. This happens to be the case across multiple components of nature, including ecosystems, uh, land ecosystems, uh, aquatic ecosystems, uh, and their degradation, and also their av availability. In particular, when we evaluate uh, over time, uh, using using data going back to uh, back to 80s uh, on an annual basis, we find that countries are more conflict prone if they have uh, less agricultural land available, or that agricultural land is 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 uh, is less productive uh, due to degradation. We also find that the countries tend to be more conflict prone, prone when they're more dependent on natural rate, uh, natural resources or when drought events are are more frequent. And here again, uh, uh, linkages come. Uh, uh, to climate change uh, that uh, is expected to aggravate these, uh, these issues. The, the report uh, lays out the evidence uh, as, it, uh, as it emerges from literature and data, uh, but the main focus really is, is, to, is to focus on what can be done based on this evidence. The key finding uh, that we, we, we make here is that in a broad way, investing in conservation and restoration of nature and natural resources can help prevent conflict can help build peace. How to take advantage, how to address this issue, uh, issue um, from a kind of policy perspective varies. Uh, we lay out uh, a number of options uh, related to, for instance, improving natural resource management, conservation and restoration. There is a, um, um, a set of options uh, 
uh, that have to have to do with strengthening natural resource governance. There are issues that we have to do with reinforcing international law. There's a, a set of issues that uh, deal with transboundary resource management, which is one area where uh, uh, evidence is uh, uh, is in place that uh, you know investing in transboundary resource management has uh, has already um, yielded benefits in reducing pressures that drive conflict. The key implications on the on uh, on on from the from the findings vary by. Uh, by actors, and uh, for instance, natural resource governance and conservation management agencies, uh, we find that uh, for their operations, uh, it's important to notice that effective conservation and restoration of nature can in indeed uh, uh, contribute to mitigating and uh, preempting armed conflict. For international law, one of the key findings is, is, the, is the need to enforce law, including uh, protections for, uh, for protected area staff and sanctions against environmental war crimes. Humanitarian and development agencies, uh, um, we, we, we call them to strengthen management and conservation by way of improving both livelihoods and security, improving, uh, you know, improving them through environmental peace building. In the military and security sector, uh, investments um, in conservation can indeed uh, increase the chances of, of peace. This is a very quick overview. I'll, I'll uh, invite you to uh, see the report for further information. And I'll close by noting one critical issue that, um, that is important to, to, uh, to highlight here, and that has to do, do with gender-based violence. Uh, this is a key area of work in the conservation community, especially at IUCN. Uh, last year, IUCN uh, published a report on gender-based violence, um, at, um, and, uh, and uh, it, it addresses these issues uh, uh, from a broad uh, uh, range of, uh, of case studies and, and evidence. I invite you also to, uh, to check the, uh, the report uh, that is available at this link. I'll post these links uh, in the chat function uh, uh, so that you have them readily available. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Yuha. And I just want to pick up on a, a couple of points briefly before we move on. You know, and I'll, I'll um, address the, the last point you made first, which is the gender dimension. Thank you very much for bringing this into the discussion. Um, you know, IUCN is, is doing some very good work in this area. And, you know, I think your, your publication from last year, which really looks at these links between environmental degradation in different forms and Increased incidence of gender-based violence not only illustrates the need for a gendered approach to risk analysis and security responses, but it also highlights these deeper connections between different patterns of criminality, abuse, and control. And I think it's really interesting for our partners in security and justice institutions to think about how they can take this into account as they prioritize risk analysis and responses in the future, and also think about sources of resilience. Uh, and you've also highlighted a couple of um, interesting points we might be able to get into more detail on in the Q&A around the role of the security and justice sectors in this space um, to include enforcement of environmental legislation, thinking about physical protection of, of uh, conservation areas, although being mindful as well, I know you've, you've said in previous publications uh, of the risks potentially posed by militarization of conservation. Uh, but thanks very much. Uh, and that's actually a nice um, transition into our next speaker, who is Captain Steve Brock. Uh, Steve is currently serving as senior advisor with the Council on Strategic Risks and the Center for Climate and Security. He is also chief of staff of the International Military Council on Climate and Security. Steve is a principal at nature-based climate solutions firm, Provenance Company, Regeneration Management Partners, and he's an adjunct of the RAND Corporation. He previously served as deputy director for intelligence and chair of the functional capabilities board at the joint staff. He also co-chaired an interagency policy committee at the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and prior to this, this served in a number of senior capacities in the US military. Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Abby. I'd like to wish everybody a happy uh, autumn equinox. And uh, just as the sun is essential uh, to our existence, um, going forward, uh, so is building environmental security, climate security, competency and fluency uh, into all of our security institutions um, so that we can have a, a future um, to go to, uh, to look forward to. And uh, in, in, uh, to support that, I'm gonna offer seven concrete steps in the next seven minutes. Uh, that security institutions can, uh, can seize upon uh, to make that a reality. Um, the first is seizing the geopolitical moment to integrate uh, climate and environmental security into all of our national and international security policy making. Uh, I'll use the example of the, the Colombian Peace Accords, uh, the first peace treaty in history to integrate uh, uh, climate, uh, sustainable rural economic development and sustainability uh, you know, into the agreement. 
by harnessing uh, multiple climate focused, environmentally focused stakeholders in Northern Europe uh, to, uh, to underwrite the peace process, uh, carbon tax to, uh, to pay for pork reintegration um, and several other initiatives that were intended to preserve the vast uh, Amazon rainforests, rainforests that were now uh, being threatened by um, slash and burn uh, economic development and exploitation. Um, of course, not being uh, sort of implemented on the ground as it was initially entirely conceived uh, within the agreement. But what really struck me about it were, uh, were three things. Um, first, uh, during my time at the National Security Council and at the Pentagon and working with the State Department over my career, uh, never before had I thought of integrating climate and environmental aspects to bring in new uh, powerful stakeholders into that process. Uh, a, com a country that had been at the core of our South American security policy uh, for decades and the billions of dollars that we spent on that. So we need to think of every single security aspect um, from an environmental and climate uh, perspective to, to, uh, to, to make those grand bargains. Second, I'd never heard of it uh, until I was well out of those jobs. So we need to do a much better job with our strategic communications of linking environmental security, ecological security to all we're doing in, in, in that space and link it in particular to water and, and food security. Um, third, it's a great example of how to solve an intractable conflict decades long. There's many other intractable conflicts that, are, that, are de that were decades in the making by bringing in the environmental aspect to it. So we should think hard about other areas in the world where we can use the power of uh, the movement behind climate and the movement about uh, getting a hold of our environmental security uh, to solve some long intractable problems. Uh, the fourth concrete step is climate and environment uh, security risk assessment tools. There's a lot of talk about that, a big focus on sort of the, you know, very complex, expensive, whiz-bang, um, sub-seasonal, uh, seasonal forecasting, et cetera. But even in simple things, for instance, the UN now requiring uh, UN force commanders at peace commissions around the world, all 13 of them, uh, hopefully in the near term, to make climate security, environmental security observations and assessments as part of their uh, semi-annual reports to the Security Council is just one of many ways that we can use current existing uh, tools to get that risk assessment and those and, and sort of best practices um, to, the, uh, to the folks uh, that need to use it. Uh, fifth concrete uh, recommendation is we need to integrate climate environmental security aspects into all of our procurement and acquisition decisions as institutions. Uh, this is not only about the multi-billion dollar programs that defense establishments uh, procure, but also the thousands of uh, integrated supply chains that we all have putting out a demand signal that those have to be sustainable, environmentally responsible, um, will have ripple effects across all of our economies and, uh, and we have the buying power to do it. On the more expensive billion dollar side of things, uh, we need to integrate uh, not only sort of uh, what everybody's focused on as far as uh, carbon neutral or energy efficient acquisition decisions, uh, but also we just need to integrate simple environmental and climate uh, considerations. I chaired the Functional Capabilities Board that uh, Abby mentioned that put multi-billion dollar radars on Kwajalein of the thousands of cost performance decisions that we uh, deliberated and debated. We never thought of sea level rise or saltwater inundation um, to the uh, low-lying atolls um, in our Pacific partners. Um, and we're gonna be spending billions of dollars to try to adapt our way out of that. Um, there's also a lesson learned there uh, going forward as we negotiate uh, future compact agreements with our Pacific partners integrating their very real sea level and uh, sea level rise concerns into uh, those considerations um, should, should drive those uh, negotiations in the next two to three years as they all come due for renegotiation. Six concrete uh, example is land. Um, as security institutions, and I'll, and I'll just highlight the US Defense Department, uh, we have 27 million acres uh, in the continental United States. Uh, many more millions are leased from other parts of the federal government. We have overseas bases. Many of our partners around the world also are very large landholders. There's a tremendous opportunity to better manage those lands from an environmental perspective, to get a drought, uh, fire resistance, uh, you know, reduce flooding, um, and use that as a, as a um, demonstration of the power of, of soil health and land management from a resilience perspective to the rest of our, uh, rest of our, rest of our global land holdings, whether they be private or public. Um, and even innovative you know, suggestions such as using our overhead um, space-based uh, and air breather uh, security collection assets to monitor those landscapes for soil health um, and environmental uh, resilience. And finally, um, with uh, just over a minute to go, uh, the most important part of my presentation, human resources, your HR department. So 
Uh, we're only going to succeed at this if it's an all hands on deck effort. So uh, career paths in environmental and climate security or in standard career tracks, career enhancing assignments that focus on these things. Promotion boards, evaluations, awards, hiring criteria, all can be uh, retooled to focus on environmental and climate security, currently not happening. Fellowships for folks to come into government with expertise to help us in security institutions, whether they're government-based or non-government-based, uh, to get all of the great thought that's going on in these fields that, that currently doesn't reside there, or sabbaticals to allow folks that are working in security institutions to go out for a year or two, get that, uh, get that information and bring it back to, to make our institutions a lot better. And finally, uh, the last point I make is uh, recruit the climate engaged generation. Um, our security institutions, especially those um, on the military side, are youth organizations. The turnover is immense. The average age is very young. Uh, for those that have been around a long time, we're just learning about these things now at the later ends of our careers. There's a whole generation out there that are focused on climate. They're committed to climate. It's their future. We need to put together programs that entice them to join our organizations um, and carry this fight forward, which is going to be decades in, uh, in, 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 the, in correcting and getting things back on track. And I'll end there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Steve. Thanks for bringing the, the formal presentation portion of, of today's discussion to such a, a concrete uh, and practical close. Um, I just want to pick on a, a, on a couple of things you said. Um, you know, first, I think you've done a great job, you know, talking a little bit about how we can bring climate awareness into all aspects of organizational management strategy and operations um, and do that very practically. You know, we've, we've talked um, from different perspectives about resources um, throughout the panel discussion. And, you know, you've, you've talked about, I think, what is um, a point not to be overlooked, which is that our human resources are really the most valuable resources we have in organizations. And it is our duty to, uh, to prepare them for the future and prepare them to help us um, bring climate considerations into the security sector in a more comprehensive and, and systematic way. Uh, you've also really nicely illustrated how to mobilize and leverage this logistical and organizational capacity, which is available in the security sector, especially in the military. Uh, and finally, you know, you've, you've also reminded us that this can be, you know, a, a key pillar of security cooperation. And it is really useful for us to think together with our partners about how environmental risks can inform security partnerships and capacity building programs. And I am certain that many of our partners in the field um, would be very happy to help us continue this conversation and, and to shape that moving forward. So thanks again, uh, many thanks to all of our panelists. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Viola to kick off the Q&A portion of today's event. Thank you very much, Abby, and also thanks a lot to all panelists for their interventions. And at this point, I'm really inviting our audience to write your questions in the chat in the Q&A function, and we'll try to cluster as best as we can. But to start off, as off, maybe we could deep dive a bit more into this institutional setup and the coordination arrangements. So I would first asked Animesh, what have you seen has worked particularly well in terms of institutional arrangements? And then maybe Steve, coming back to some of your recommendations, for example, on human resource management, how could this be translated into also security cooperation and SSR programming with partners? Yeah, thanks, Viola. So, I mean, different countries have uh, provided different examples of how or um, they have tried to do security sector reforms in the context of disaster risk reduction and using or changing the terms of reference of the existing institutions. So from my own stay and experience in Africa, uh, within a very short duration, many countries in uh, starting from Northern to Horn of Africa to South and Southeast Africa had moved their disaster risk management portfolio from a sectoral or a civil protection ministry to the office of the prime minister of the president to ensure that they could coordinate across different sectors and different ministries because uh, disaster risk reduction is a multi-sectoral responsibility and hence that's what uh, they did. And there were also examples of how the existing disaster management offices which still remains in 
a very military centric or a civil defense centric uh, organization has expanded its own scope of work to ensure that they can better integrate prevention approaches and resilience building approaches. I would say examples would include Mauritius, um, Philippines, Mongolia, are some very good examples where it's still owned by the civil defense organizations or security centric organizations, but they have expanded to acknowledge the growing complexity of risk and hence expand the scope of their work. All these organizations, whether uh, they are in the um, office of the head of the government or in a very security sector organization, when they have expanded their scope, have ensured that they have established a division looking into the prevention aspects. And that's where they have ensured that they can coordinate across many sectors and across different ministries. Point being that uh, risk management is a multi-sectoral responsibility. And hence, unless we ensure that this multi-sectoral responsibility is ensured through any institutional reform, we will not be able to actually address the risk in an ex ante manner. Thanks. Thank you, Animesh. And over to you, Steve. Oh yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think one of the, you know, one of the biggest parts that we need to integrate from the human resources side um, goes hand in hand with education and training. Um, you know, we, uh, in, in usually in security institutions, um, we really pride ourselves on um, on our education curricula and on our training regimes. In fact, most of what we do a lot of the time is training. Um, and by incorporating these kind of aspects into into those two very important pillars. Um, you can then start doing some of the things that I that I recommended. For instance, um, you know, showing awareness and competency, you know, in these areas could be critical for promotion or for awards. Uh, nothing drives uh, um, sort of creativity and initiative like awards do, at least from 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 my um, experience um, in security institutions. Um, and then also, uh, it would th th that would help sort of make hiring managers more adept at asking the right questions and identifying the right people to bring into our organizations. Um, and so I, that, that's one of the big things that, that I would say is um, education training uh, hand in hand with some of these other administrative procedures, I think would uh, far more quickly than, than one would really realize, start to change the culture and start to change what people see as their job. Because too long, these issues have been stovepiped or pushed aside by the real decision makers to an area of the enterprise which doesn't get nearly the budget or the say or the influence that it needs. That has to change or we're gonna be talking about this years from now. So I have a, a question here that I think um, I will direct to Matisse, uh, which is, you know, what is, what is your position on growth and can we see growth as a driver for conflict and and then within that context what do we think is the future of a security sector um, in a world in which the economy is going to be shrinking uh, in a way that is not uh, not voluntary so how do we see this relationship between growth conflict and what security actually looks like in the future matisse over that, to you that yeah, that's an excellent question. Be growth is something extremely magical because it produces more and more cake and it reduces conflict. So, so having a time of growth is the most wonderful thing for a society because you can promise more things in the future. So the question is not whether we want growth or not. It could be a, a good strategy, but what happens if you're not able to get the growth because then the conflicts start to increase. And I think that's kind of the big blind spot we see in any like in, in the in, in the in, in economic plans, I don't know of many of or any significant economic plans that put resource security at the center of their attention. And that may have worked in the beginning of the Ponzi scheme. It doesn't work any longer and becomes an enormous a, a, an enormous risk. So so for me, it's in, in the end the kind of the litmus test is. Are economic plans with their competitiveness plans? I mean, they're also kind of as we think about security. Do they take resource security seriously? For example, the UK as a country uses four times more regenerative capacity than is available within the UK. Now, the UK may have a financial advantage. Will it have it forever? There's so many countries who don't have the financial advantages right now. It becomes just a structural pressure if we don't address it so perhaps growth is not the question but i think i mean it's about how do we generate wealth and 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 having not enough resources is a wealth deficit that can 
move through the entire value system. Just to start to stop with an example. It's perhaps a silly example, just more as an empl emblematic example. <clears throat> Cape Town didn't pay much for water, you know, but without water, the value of the entire city goes to zero. And they've been able to get around that. But the, but the significance of resources to drive economic activities is underestimated and still isn't in the economic development plans. And that's kind of the highest risk. Thanks very much, Matisse. And I think you're, you know, you're, you're very clearly illustrating also how questions of, of growth and, and really questions of, of resources and these pressures on resources and ultimately overshoot, you know, really do become a, a national security issue um, and, and they deserve a place in, in national security planning paradigms. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Viola for the next question. Thank you, Abby. So we've had a question on indicators and I see that Jonathan you already started putting some answer in the chat but I think it would be interesting to hear a bit more about this so indicators to measure the relationship between environmental change and security and maybe as a second voice we would also like to hear a bit from you if you have anything on indicators um Thanks, Fiola. There's a couple of points I'd make here. First of all, we're, we're actually going through a review process of our framework at the moment. So we're actually reviewing our environmental indicators and how they, how they relate to those and other dimensions. I think the important point, and hopefully the point I got across in my introduction, is that often it's the indicators in the economic domain or in the societal domain that tell you as much about the environment as, say, the natural environment indicators themselves, because they tell you how people are responding to the within the ecosystem that they exist within. And that's something that we hope to develop as part of our, as part of the next iteration of the OECD's fragility framework. So it's, again, it's looking at those interconnections and seeing what they, what they tell us about the, the environmental interconnectedness as much as anything else. Uh, so I, I would say from that point of view, uh, a, spa a space to watch. I would, um, and I think the other side of that, that we're, the other real area of potential we're seeing here is looking at the literature on ecological analysis or the kinds of the analysis that Matthias and and you are doing and seeing how we can integrate that into our fertility analysis because to come back to um, uh, Captain Steve's point we have uh, if you look at the Columbia example what they are looking at there are the root causes of fragility and conflict and how to build in solutions to those root causes at the earliest possible point of view uh, so I, I think it's 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 not necessarily look about a, a and narrowing the focus to just the kind of natural environmental indicators. It's about looking at them within a, mu a much broader system of indicators and what that can tell us about it. And the final point I'll make on it is the issue we have in fragile and conflict affected contexts is getting good data. And I think that, that's something that we'll, we'll need to look at as part of this conversation overall. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jonathan. One other point building on Nimesh, what you mentioned about the relationship between DRR and sustainable development, maybe you could tell us also a little bit more about what does this mean in terms of planning on the one hand, but then also in terms of financing. And I don't know, Jonathan, if we could call upon you again also to come in on the financing side, given your OECD hat. Yeah, I think the most important aspect of linking planning and development from the disaster reduction angle is to have the right risk information in place so that one, we ensure that uh, preventive approaches are promoted so that they don't cause a dent to developmental gains. But at the same time, we ensure that risk is integrated into developmental processes so, so that the developmental processes do not create risks for the future. If we know that a road in an ecologically sensitive area will create environmental disasters for the future, and we need to do a proper risk assessment to ensure that does not happen. That is what we call as a risk-informed sustainable development. Again, moving it forward to the financing aspects of it, the same logic applies that any investment that is made needs to be risk-informed to ensure that we have done the proper risk assessment to ensure that the infrastructure investments that go into trillions of dollars do not create a risk for itself. As of now, we know that around $93 trillion will be invested into infrastructure in, uh, in the next uh, 
two decades or so. But we also know that we are losing half a trillion dollar per year on account of built environment. So for every dollar that is spent on infrastructure, we're losing a certain person because of disaster losses. And it only makes sense that we make this infrastructure resilient enough so that we don't lose our hard earned investments. So I think it's more about ensuring that risk becomes an integral part of developmental and financing processes so that we can de-risk these different processes. Thank you. So I'd like to direct our, our next, um, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just to, very, to pick up on Viola's uh, question, um, just and just I agree with everything that's just been said, but to add, I think there is also a, very, a big question around the governance of finance in this area. Um, we're already seeing, if you look at decision making across security development nexus, that there are a number of gaps there with regards to how funding is delivered into context to fund different particular areas. Uh, and often that has a result of missing environmental issues or environmental issues are somehow siloed away from that kind of decision making process, which creates more gaps. So I think this is where, for example, the recommendation on the HTTP nexus and the focus on collective outcomes could, could add, add that kind of coordination element um, that uh, Dr. Kumar mentioned earlier on, where that you're addressing you appreciate that the landscape of financing is what it is. It is, it is fragmented, fragmented often for good reasons, uh, but that if you can find ways to bring them together collectively on certain outcomes, that, that that is a way of mitigating some of the administrative risk of managing, of delivering finance in this space. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jonathan. So our next question um, has to do with a risk we haven't spoken about in, in much detail yet. Um, and you had like to direct this question to you. Uh, and the question is, um, you know, in a context of uh, increasing resource pressures and, and a changing environment, what risks are being faced by land and environmental defenders? Uh, and do we see a role for the security and justice sectors in, in responding to these risks? Thank you, thank you, Abby. Um, well, um, the environmental defenders even today uh, face incredible risks, uh, the number of, uh, of environmental defenders uh, um, uh, being uh, being uh, uh, persecuted, being being harmed, uh, you know, being killed, uh, is is incredibly high. You know, I think the latest numbers are uh, show that it's over two hundred per year um, uh, that that get killed, uh, you know, let alone on alone harmed. Uh, so it's a critical issue. Um, the, the one issue there, of course, is is to extend uh, and enforce uh, laws and regulations, including you know potentially in, in international law. To protect environmental defenders, um, how to how to achieve that in in practice is is of course challenging. Uh, one way of doing that is is to at least um, uh, provide uh, information on the on the on the risks uh, that the environmental defenders face, um, and and uh, and the the unfortunate outcomes that that, that result from those risks. Um, and this is one of the key issues for IUC and certainly to, to address that for many other conservation organizations uh, uh, to, uh, to to highlight. So the the the, the risks are 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 very uh, very real. Thank you, Juha. Maybe one last question as we're, we'll unfortunately have to wrap up after this round of Q&A. Um, on Steve's presentation, one issue that came up with me, what about integrating environmental security considerations also into big bilateral security and defense programs that might be focused on anti-terrorism, etc.? Maybe, Steve, you could speak a little bit about that. Uh, yes, there's a tremendous opportunity to integrate uh, these issues into a whole host of programs that already exist. Um, we mentioned bilaterally, so uh, there's, there's several bilateral programs that DOD has and the State Department also has, um, where these things I, you know, I've recommended in the past could be um, integrated uh, in a way actually that would make the rest of the, the other components of those existing programs even, even more effective. Um, from a multilateral perspective, um, you know, th there, there are many things that could be done um, at the United Nations that don't require a UN Security Council resolution or a General Assembly resolution. Uh, I touched on the, uh, the semi-annual reports, uh, but there's a whole host of other things uh, being worked at the, uh, the new climate security mechanism that's been set up there. And then NATO, um, you know, NATO uh, also very, very 
sort of nascent efforts in, in this field, um, proposal to set up a center for excellence on climate security um, in Canada, uh, which could be populated with, with, with many of the, uh, the, the, the reports and, and other work that we've discussed in this call today as a good starting point. Um, it, it's, it's a wide open frontier um, and a sort of blank canvas on new multilateral agreements, but on the bilateral side, I can think of seven or eight programs, you know, within DOD um, where this this could be uh, integrated, especially especially in areas of um, security capacity building um, through the Institute of Security Governance, Santa Monterey, et cetera. Excellent, thanks very much, Steve. And I'd like to turn it back over to Yuha one more time, uh, just to give us his perspective on uh, both uh, the question around indicators as well as the question on growth. Yuha, over to you. Thank you, Abby. Uh, so uh, a question came up on, on indicators and that this is of course uh, critical that we have robust, uh, scientifically robust uh, uh, solid data available to guide our decisions. Uh, these indicators are, are quite well available, especially on the ecolog ecological side, uh, uh, including species extinction risks, uh, habitat condition and so forth. What's oftentimes very critical is to have those data not only at national level, but also at the local level. So, you know, we see a critical need uh, to develop uh, more granular, granular data on the condition of, uh, of nature and, uh, and how, uh, how it changes over time and over space. Um, economic data is, uh, is oftentimes not, uh, not necessarily linked to ecological data. So linking those ecological data to economic data is, is also very critical both at the national and local levels. And one issue here has to do with, I think, in Mathis, Mathis you, you, you mentioned uh, um, about growth and, uh, and the importance of growth. One challenge with the growth, of course, is that we, we, we don't measure growth in a way that would incor incorporate uh, the nature, nature in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the measures of growth. So GDP, for instance, uh, only partially measures the contributions of nature to economy and only very partially takes into account uh, the loss related to the degradation and loss of nature. So we need, we need much better data on growth. We actually, today, we don't know whether the growth is really true, true growth. And here, the, uh, the uh, development and, and uh, adoption of uh, the uh, system of uh, environmental economic accounting, you know, ecosystem accounting, just recently this March as an international standard uh, by the UN uh, is, a, is a critical uh, you know, step in, in going beyond GDP. So we find that uh, that as a, as a really important uh, piece of information moving forward. Thank you. Th thank you for that, Debbie. Thanks. Thanks, Yuha. And actually, that's a, a perfect note on which to hand it over to Viola for our last question for the panelists. Viola, over to you. Thank you, Abby. And I mean, one of the purposes for us to bring together this panel of, of distinguished experts from such a variety of disciplinary backgrounds and policy communities and practitioner communities is also to see how you can mutually enrich yourself. So for that, we have now a kind of innovation test question for you. So after having had this exchange and having heard also some concrete proposals from other policy domains, then engaged with the audience through the chat. If there was one priority action to maximize the potential of the linkages we discussed today to be taken now, what would you recommend it to be? Please, Jonathan, if you could start. Thanks. Uh, well, picking up from the last point, building data and knowledge on the disproportionate impact of ecological change on, on groups within fragile contexts. Um, if we think about how we plan and make decisions, if we think about the cross-border and regional implications uh, that, that have been raised today, the importance of early dialogue on certain issues, uh, the identification of the convergence of risk, it all starts with a firm evidence base. And I think the challenge in particular that we face is that evidence base in fragile contexts is often, is often very weak and they need support uh, to, to help build that base. Uh, so that's, that's where I would start investing in building data and knowledge for fragile context. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Matisse, over to you. Th thank you so much. So the clear answer is there's no silver bullet, <laughs> but it's not about the individual disasters in the end. They're just symptoms. They are the lost straws that break the camel's back. But the question is like, is it possible to like systematically increase resource insecurity and, and, and be safe? It's, it's that insecurity of resource availability that I think be, generates the unpleasant un, um, outcomes. And as um, 
you had pointed out, it's this GDP focused where we maximize income and ignore wealth that is so dangerous. That's why I would say if there's one thing we should focus on, and there should be many things, is going back to the economic and security plans, economic plans that are blind to resource security, that don't take that at the center of their attention, are becoming the largest liabilities. Thank you, Matthias. And Animes, your action point, please. Thanks, Well, Actually, Jonathan just mentioned what I was going to say in terms of having the right analytics, the data in place, which provides the hardcore evidence. But um, just to kind of uh, build further on that, I mean, the role of the security sector in ex ante risk management um, acting ahead of disasters has not been explored enough. And I think that's something which needs to be done further. And to do so, uh, we need to enhance the awareness of the security sector in the role they can play in resilience building, enhance their capacity to do so, and ensure that the security sector is proactively engaged in comprehensive risk analysis to be able to close this gap between ex ante and ex post climate and disaster risk management. And just to add something further, which just strikes me, that there are many Security Council resolutions on climate change, which have often not been implemented at the country level. And I think it's a very right opportune time to ensure to go back to some of those resolutions and see ensure that they are implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Animesh. And it's great to already see some convergence among our panelists. With that, next would be Yuha, please. Thank you. Thank you, Viola. Uh, I'll second uh, strongly what Jonathan and Mathis uh, already mentioned and Animesh too on, on, on data, but I'll, I'll extend uh, by raising the issue of partnerships. So um, we, we know that nature, natural resources have a, a role in the context of security. We, we, we're, we're confident that there are ways of uh, addressing these issues in a proactive way, not being reactive when the conflict already, already emerges, but be proactive uh, uh, in mitigating the pressures that drive conflict. This is relevant for many actors, including natural resource government, governance agencies, conservation management agencies, human and development agencies, the military and security sector. None of these actors will be able to take full advantage of the, of the need and, and opportunities that are, are, are in this space. So there's a critical need for, uh, for increased uh, uh, coordination and partnership in this space. Uh, how to make that happen? Uh, there is a, a work in this space in, in environmental peace building, but I would say that clearly uh, more, more is needed. Thanks. Thanks very much, Juha. And then last but not least, Steve, please. Thank you. Um, you know, many of the things that, that I've talked about, many of the things that we've talked about on the panel today are absolutely essential, um, but they're not sufficient. If you look at the crisis as an existential threat, that's unprecedented. You know, many of the things we've talked about are essential to do things the way we've always done, how we conceive security, how we've done security operations, military operations for centuries, if not thousands of years. But if you take a step beyond that and see it as an existential threat we've never had to deal with before as security institutions, then I would go back to um, you know, what I beat on before. And that was, we have to get the attention, the undivided attention of the top national security and international security decision makers to prioritize this, to make it a top mission and to assume risk in other areas that they're not willing to assume risk in right now. The folks that I talk to um, that are in the US uh, security establishment right now that have these climate related and environmental related jobs that just been stood up, their biggest concern right now is they're not getting enough attention and all the work that they're doing is not really sort of getting the bandwidth it needs with the key decision makers. We're not going to solve the existential threat until it's a top priority. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. And also thanks for the other ones for their ideas. And I think that the key trends are this is a a really important topic, but we all need to work on raising even more awareness and a sense of urgency than the need for more data from various angles and aspects. And then finally, this point about partnerships. And I'm really hopeful that also today's event can contribute towards building these partnerships and bringing brilliant minds who are working on this issue from different angles together. With that, I will hand over to my colleague, Abby, for some reflections and ideas on where to go from there. 
Thanks very much, Viola. You know, I think it was clear going into today's conversation that, of course, there is a role for the security and justice sectors to play in this space. But what's been so helpful about what we've heard from our panelists and some of the questions we've gotten from the audience, I think it's been to, to help us develop a more nuanced sense of where some of the opportunities and the entry points might be. Um, and also, in some cases, to help us think about how we might reframe our understanding of the risks we're facing. It's also very clear that good governance in this context is going to be crucial. Uh, good governance will be important in order to make sure, for example, that security responses actually meet the needs of communities, especially the most vulnerable. And in some cases, also think about the needs of the ecosystems on which those communities depend. Good governance will be important as well to make sure resources are used in a way that is transparent, accountable, effective, and of course, sustainable and also to mitigate any potential risks that might arise from having security institutions involved in this space. I think across many contexts at the moment, the conversation is really about whole of government and even whole of society responses to climate change and security and justice are, are one part of that. In terms of future reforms, I think our discussion has highlighted ways in which institutions can better understand risks and on that basis, adapt to meet changing needs. And, and we've heard, um, I think, throughout the discussion about the, the need for data to be a, a real part of that risk analysis and the need for improved data. Um, it's a multi-dimensional issue, certainly, with a range of implications for security and justice providers, uh, including risk analysis, how we identify our priorities, capability development, training and education of our workforce, and of course, partnerships with this continued emphasis on bridging policy domains. And we hope, I think above all, that the discussion has helped everyone in the audience think with us about how focusing at the intersection of human security and the environment might be able to assist us in responding more effectively to some of the common and um, seemingly insurmountable challenges we're facing. Uh, it might help us as well to prioritize and better use scarce resources. And also, I think just to think differently about what it is that might make us safer and more secure uh, in the future. And I think we've heard some very interesting perspectives on that today. We'll be publishing a short report from today's event uh, and also making the recording available online. And we see this really as um, a part of a series of conversations and contributions on these topics. We'll have another event later this year, which focuses on bringing together colleagues from partner security and other institutions. Uh, to look at some of these issues of risk and resilience from a more regional perspective. That may also be a chance for us to share some work we ourselves have been doing on, on indicators to help better align and, and orient uh, interventions at the intersection of, of human security and the environment. And we also have a, a policy paper and other publications coming out. And so we will be uh, providing updates on our website in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and with that, I would like to say a big thank you to all of our panel members. We're very grateful for your contributions today. Thanks as well to everyone who took the time to join us today in the audience. And last but not least, a thank you to our interpreters as well. And we hope to welcome many of you back to another event in the future. Thank you.